Let's start chapter five, which is about understanding buyer behavior and the communication process. The learning outcomes for this chapter is to describe the four stages of consumer decision making, explain how consumers adapt their decision making process based on involvement and experience, discuss how brand communication influences consumer psychological states and behavior, describe the interaction of culture and advertising, explain how sociological factors affect consumer behavior, and discuss how advertisement transmits sociocultural meaning in order to sell things. And for this, we have to refer back to the decision-making process that you learned or covered in Principles of Marketing course. Remember that consumers usually go to a number of steps when deciding uh, which products to, to purchase. The first stage is the so-called need recognition. This is a process that begins with when consumers perceive they have a need, uh, functional or emotional. This is a discrepancy between your current state and desire state, right? So you are hungry, that's a, a, a discrepancy, a mismatch between your current state and a desire state, which is to satisfy your hunger. Um, then you move on into a, a second stage, which is deciding where to go uh, for lunch to, to, to have something to eat. And this may be based on previous information you have, right? Internally, you, you remember you have been to some places, you remember you have seen a restaurant there, um, or externally, you find, you look for information um, that you probably find in, in, in consumer reviews and reports, um, recommendations, right? So there are th there are different options that you have in the so-called consideration set. The consideration sets are those products that you come to consider more closely in your final purchase decision. You remember two or three or four places, and out of those you will decide based on some type of evaluative criteria, right? So for, for this evaluation of alternatives, you have criteria. What is important um, if you are going to go uh, to have lunch? Well, you want a, a Chinese food restaurant. You maybe uh, want more Mexican food or some fast food or low calories, healthier something that is closed within few blocks or are you willing to drive 10 15 minutes so this is this this these are examples of different criteria that you may have also the price of course um is is part of this criteria and according to those different um, um criteria points you decide and purchase something that you expect will satisfy your needs, your expectations. And this is not where the process ends. There is a fourth stage, which is the, the post-purchase evaluation, the post-purchase use stage in which you develop some positive or negative evaluations. A, a positive satisfaction would be, of course, that when the product delivers on those benefits that you expected, or maybe not. Uh, and this is in psychology field called the cognitive dissonance. You realize that uh, what you purchase is not uh, necessarily what you expected, right? Uh, maybe you learn after your purchase that there are other other products that could have 
fulfill better what you wanted, but you are not going to return what you have already because you have spent on that. So these four stages um, are the standard consumer decision-making process. However, um, not all purchases uh, individually go through all these stages. Sometimes you skip some of these stages because it depends on other factors. You have um, some purchases for which you have more involvement, some other purchases for which you have more experience or less experience. So there is this model for different type of purchases or decision making according to the level of involvement and according to the experience. These four categories are the extended problem solving with high involvement, low experience. Second, the limited problem solving with low involvement, low experience. Third, the habit or variety seeking with low involvement, high experience and brand loyalty with high involvement, high experience. This exhibit illustrates these four categories better. On the upper left hand side, you have the type of purchase in which you go through all of the stages that we saw a couple of slides earlier, right? From need recognition to information search and alternative evaluation, um, purchase, per purchase evaluation. And this is because these are situations in which, for instance, you are going to buy a new car and it's the first time you buy a new car, then you have low experience, right? As we see here, low experience in, in purchasing new cars and you have high level of involvement. Why? Because it is an expensive product. You don't purchase a car every other week. So uh, it is important what, what is the outcome of this decision, right? The same thing when you purchase, um, I don't know, a house. Of course, this is the most expensive thing you, you probably buy in your life. So the, the risk and, and, and the outcome uh, is of high importance. So you look for information right if you're gonna buy a, a car well you have evaluative criteria that you carefully um, take into account what type of car the the, the fuel efficiency uh, etc the price of course uh, whether you want a japanese car or an, Ameri an american car a pickup truck or suv so these are the type of decision-making process for which you cognitively engage into trying to solve a problem in the optimal, in the most optimal way, the most optimal way. Moving to the right hand side on, 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 on this category of decision-making, we have the so-called limited problem solving, right? There is low level of, of involvement low level of experience, right? You have in your test book this example of um, someone who is, is, is looking to, to buy diapers, right? And well, you don't have experience on that. It is not a big purchase, something that you spend much on it. So you are more willing to try um, maybe a coupon, maybe find information from uh, advertisement as credible and you are willing to try because th those are the purchases for which um, people don't see high level of risk. Yeah, it may be the first time I buy a product, right, because I have no experience, but the outcomes are not going to be that uh, serious if I don't make the right choice. One more time, for this type of purchases, mm, consumers are more prone to uh, to be 
influenced by sales promotions, for example, right? Coupons, etc. That 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 price discount may be the the determinant factor for deciding something. Next type of uh, decision making process under this framework is that of low level of involvement on the right hand side here in the lower part low level of in involvement but high level of experience something that you have purchased in the past over and over right is not a an expensive product usually right like toothpaste a toothbrush or detergent things like this um, that you use over and over and you always buy the same product just because that's that's what you've done in the past that may be what your family detergent um, uh, was when you were growing up so you still buy it so you have a lot of experience you have purchased this over and over um, but it's not an expensive or uh, product or something for which you have uh, a serious um, outcome that, that will change things in your life, right? Now, this could be a category in which you either develop a habit for purchasing certain products and brands, but you also have, on the other hand, customers who, who demonstrate a variety seeking, right? They don't just stay with the habit of purchasing the same product over and over, but they do uh, instead try different brands just because they don't want to get bored, right? So they try different flavors. They try different uh, presentations. Why? Because this is a low involvement, um, low involvement uh, type of approach you have a lot of experience and precisely because of that, you probably get bored of the same thing. Um, so for this category, for a low involvement and a high level of experience, you, you, you may have either a habit developed or variety seeking uh, behavior, right? Moving to the left, uh, lower left hand side of this exhibit, you have the situation where you have high level of involvement and high level of experience. So here, this is what we call the brand loyalty scenario. Because even though you have high level of experience, you have a connection, you have uh, an attachment with a product, with a brand. Usually this goes, this goes beyond the, the mere functional attributes of a, of a product, normally you develop some um, attachment that is not just a habit. You do not just buy the same product or prefer a brand because it's, it's a habit, but you actually uh, are committed to these products. And I think uh, a good example of this, well, among others, is Harley Davidson, right? Mm, Apple brand. So these are brands that have developed um, a, a customer base that is very loyal, but because they, these are products for which customers have high level of involvement, right? Like, like your smartphone, like your a motorcycle. This, these are type of products, categories for which people mm, have high involvement and also um, a high level of experience. So they prefer the brand because they know other brands, they know what other competing brands offer and still they, they, are, um, they have the conviction that this brand is the most appropriate. Now, moving, moving on to connect this topic with the with the core of this course is the communication process how when marketers do promotion advertising uh, what does this have to do with this um, consumer decision making process well this 
This is important because precisely you want to understand what are the psychological processes that allow marketers and advertisers to, to persuade consumers, right? To com convince the audience the, who is watching your commercial, your um, uh, advertisement, why, why this message is there for them and what is what you try to, to accomplish. And for this purpose, we have to look at the basis of advertising in terms of the effect you want to achieve. People have beliefs, people have beliefs about things, right? And uh, this is what shapes their attitudes. Why are attitudes important? Well, if we refer back to the decision-making process stages, it is in the evaluation of alternatives, in the search of information, where people draw and, 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 and recover this uh, or base their decision according to the attitudes which are driven by their beliefs, right? People have salient belief about things that matter to them regarding a product and those are the determinants of attitudes towards brands. So when you want to convince a customer that a car offers safety, what you want them is to believe that safety is an important attribute or characteristics of your automobile brand, which is the case of Volvo, right? As we see on this slide. Therefore, it is important to first understand what are the beliefs that people have about our brand, about our products, because that determines the attitudes they have and therefore we have also to look at the other options that consumers have uh, in terms of competing products, competing brands. If we, if we refer back to the decision-making process model, in the evaluation of alternative stage, consumers will wait, they will uh, compare different attributes of um, products according to the evaluative criteria. So you as a marketer need to be aware of what are those attributes that are possessed by competing brands, by competing products, so that you can um, get an edge and leverage on those benefits, on those advantages that your product possesses. One of the most uh, well-known models for analyzing these um, differences between products and brands is the multi-attribute attitude models. These multi-attribute attitude models uh, are based on four components as we see on this slide. First, evaluative criteria, which are the actual attributes that people are interested in, to the importance weights or the rankings, the consideration sets and the beliefs. So let's see in this following example with different brands of televisions, right? So this is how a multi-attribute attitude model would look like if you as a marketer want to um, do an analysis of your brand compared to other brands of televisions you would come up with the attributes right on the left column you have also the 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 rankings or the important weights which of these attributes are more important? Well, the size of screen, the stereo broadcast capability second, reputation of the brand three, etc., etc. 
you have also the consideration set, which is the, the possible uh, brands to, to select from. Prime Way, Precision, Kamashita in this, in this example. And then the evaluations, the, the ratings that consumers give for each of these brands in the consideration set for each of these attributes. So if you were to implement a model like this for your business in this product category, you would come up with a picture of what are the different uh, ratings of attributes for television products, where you are standing about competition, and therefore, what is what you need to do through your promotion and advertisement to influence consumers' attitudes. So you would say, for instance, based on these results, I see that consumers have certain beliefs about my products, certain beliefs about other products. And those beliefs are um, reflected in attitudes. Attitudes, recall, these are the evaluation that people do about uh, objects, about things, about people. So what, what can we do based on this type of analysis? Well, we can decide what aspects, what attributes, what characteristics of the product we, we should emphasize or include in the commercial messages, in advertising, in promotion. For example, after specifying the, the, the evaluative criteria, the attributes that are relevant for this brand and asking consumers to rate the brands against this criteria, which is what we saw in the previous slide, we determine which of these salient beliefs about the attributes are important and do something about it. Do something about them. What are we going to do? Are we going to maybe correct a misperception? Do we want to change or modify a wrong belief that they have? Or do we want maybe to increase the importance of one of the um, attributes. Maybe consumers do not see this attribute as important based on our multi-attribute attitude model, but we want to um, communicate or uh, persuade them that it is really important for them to consider and do not underestimate that. Maybe you want to change product characteristic because it's not something that is uh, a, a wrong perception. Maybe in reality, there is something about our product, our brand, that is not up to the expectations of consumers. So we need to do that change. Sometimes you want just to reinforce a, a belief. So if you find that there is a belief that is correct about attributes in your product, sometimes you all you want to do is to reinforce that. A lot of, a lot of the commercials that we see and, uh, and we hear and, and all these commercials that maybe do not tell us anything new, in reality, the reason why they want to um, show you this over and over is for the purpose of repetition to reinforce a, a perception that you have about a brand, right? This usually happens with mature, well-known brands, of course. They don't want to tell you anything new. All they want to tell you is to reinforce an idea, to reinforce a belief so that they, they remain in your top of mind. Now, this is not necessarily a, an easy process. If you try to send your message through advertisement, this, this is going to be um, resisted. This is not always going to go through because there, there are a number of conditions that 
have to be fulfilled. First, the member of the audience, the consumer, the viewer, has to pay attention to the message. Two, has to comprehend the message correctly without uh, distortion. Three, accept the message as it was intended. And four, last but not least, retain the message. Sometimes you pay attention to the message. Sometimes you will understand it correctly and accept it, but, but you don't remember it later. Remember some of the objectives of advertising. We saw this a um, few chapters ago is the delayed response advertisement. Why do you have a delayed response advertisement versus a direct immediate response? Well, the, the delayed response advertisement provides you the information, you retain it in your memory, and then whenever you need, you have a need for that product or service, then it pops up in your memory uh, two weeks later, three weeks later, a month later. So that's the idea of this type of um, advertisement approach. But consumers uh, have a number of defenses that prevents that your message goes through and is retained and accepted in the way you want. One of these defense is that of cognitive consistency. We, we tend to uh, have beliefs about the world around us and we, we try to keep them and stay with them and we do not easily accept things that challenge our beliefs, right? Selective attention, that's another uh, defense, another type of resistance. People simply do not pay attention to all the advertisements that they are exposed to. If you think on, on your daily life every day, you are exposed to a number of advertisements, so many that you don't even, um, you are not even conscious about how many times you, you see a billboard or you are listening um, on the radio, uh, a commercial or in TV, etc. So that is the so-called advertising clutter, right? There is so much information we are bombarded with, not just with school and, and in your relationships and in your job, but also commercial messages that you don't pay attention to, to all of them, right? Um, so if that is the case, what communication approach should marketer use? What is the best way to reach the audience considering the communication process, the decision-making stages, the level of involvement that we talk and experience we talk? There are two routes in which, uh, in which you, can, you can frame this, the central route and the peripheral route to reach your audience, to get your message through. Um, if you read in your textbook about this so-called elaboration likelihood model, you will find that it says basically the central route is utilized when you have customers who have a high level of involvement for the product category, for the brand that they are considering versus the peripheral route this peripheral route is for those uh, cases in which there is lower involvement, right? So in the central route, you find that customers elaborate, scrutinize the argument, the information provided in, in, in your promotion, in your advertisement, because these are products or decisions that have a high level of involvement and the outcomes, as we said before, are serious, are relevant. So if you buy a, a home, if you buy a, a car, those cognitive responses 
which are the thoughts that occur at the moment in which the beliefs are being challenged, right? What you believe, your attitudes are being challenged, but the commercial message, those are evaluated and you may end up either persuading, co convincing um, the consumer or not, right? But this is a highly cognitive, elaborated uh, route that if successful, changes the attitudes in the way that you want. Mm, sometimes that is not the case. Sometimes there will be a negative response from this um, customer in terms of not being able to, to persuade the, the, the consumer and, and therefore your message will be um, not considered, will not be accepted, right? It will be discarded, um, but, but this is the, the route through which messages go when you have high involvement products. On the other hand, the peripheral route is more utilized for messages that have to do with low involvement products. This is called peripheral because customers don't get into much into a cognitive elaboration or um, uh, a process to scrutinize the arguments. Right. Sometimes when there are not many difference between products in the consideration set, the way that marketers try to get the attention is by um, using uh, attractive uh, spokesperson, um, celebrities, uh, having humorous and comic uh, messages, right, or catchy music something that is uh, noisy let's say i would say for example these commercials from uh super bowl uh, um, time that you have celebrities telling you about a new flavor telling you about a new um, type of soft drink or or chips or candies right these are trying to get your attention in a peripheral manner eventually changing your attitude but the the problem with this and peripheral route is that the attitudes do not necessarily change um for a long time i mean this these are not very enduring attitude changes right <clears throat> Now, what we've seen so far uh, comes from the field of psychology and research conducted in experimental laboratory settings. And of course, that, that is shown to, to, um, to be there as effects that communication have on, on consumers. But but there is not only an information processing uh, stimulus response type of explanation to, to advertising effects. Um, yes, consumers will be uh, exposed to stimuli, but, but th th that's not the only thing that explains the effect of advertising. There, there is a fluid uh, subjective uh, context and that is culture which is in, in, in that context that advertisements are interpreted right so we are uh, uh, dealing with cultural products and therefore um, advertisement have to reflect and connect with the values of the audience. Um, they have to connect and be consistent with the shared patterns of behaviors or rituals, 
right, that people have, which are uh, in turn dependent on, on social class, the stratification. So this takes us back, back to the concept of segmentation that we, we talked um, in last chapter, chapter three, right? Because different group of consumers that we go after share different values. They um, engage in different rituals based on their stratification. And therefore the commercials, the advertisement messages will have different meanings depending on the segment of consumers that we go after. Those brands that are able to associate their, the brand with, um, with culture, they are able to, to create meaning which translates into cultural capital and this makes these commercials um, uh, more effective, right? Because these are these these are um, appropriated by consumers, and this is more meaningful to consumers. Values are the foundation of our attitudes at the end, right? Our cultural values determine and shape our attitudes that we have toward the world around us, including products, including services. And this is what ultimately will shape or determine our consumer behavior. So advertisements must be connected to these cultural values, right? They should be consistent with them because at the end, we can probably change the attitudes of consumers in a more rapid manner, but culture does not change that easily. Even though we may try as marketers to change culture, yeah, there is an influence of advertisement on culture, but this, this effect is very slow and it takes um, place over, over the years in a cumulative manner. So this is like a two-directional, um, bi-directional um, relationship here between culture and advertising, but that's the matter. That's what we are dealing with when developing advertising and promotional campaigns. We are dealing not just with information processing, but we are dealing also with culture. And culture, as you know, well, is um, manifested in, in, in different ways, right? In food, in the possessions that we give value to, in relationships, in religion, in family, in ethnicity, in music, in art, etc. Right? So it is it is very important not to miss this point and keep in consideration that whenever we are trying to persuade consumers through advertising messages we we don't just deal with functional attributes with emotional um, uh, effect but also with with culture, with identity, which is of course uh, related to symbolism of, of, of products. Especially in countries like the US where you have um, a, a, a degree of diversity in terms of, um, in terms of consumers, ethnic backgrounds, and is expected to, to, to be more diverse, um, it, is, it is necessary to take into consideration this heterogeneity of, of audiences. I recommend you to take 15 minutes to watch this segment, um, not right now, 
but these these slides are available in blackboard and you can go to this link here and this is part of this documentary that i introduced um, a couple of chapters ago watch this segment because this is showing how uh, marketers do research regarding these cultural traits that that we we talk about about family about gender about community um, about race etc um, it also gives some examples of an airline that a low-cost airline that was launched um, last decade is not um, in business anymore but it tells a little bit about how the advertising campaign that they develop try to connect with consumers in, in, in some of these dimensions that we are talking about. There is also this discussion about, well, to what extent um, the content and the message in advertisements have to be totally consistent with cultural values. And of course, this is something for which there is no one single answer. Some um, brands that have challenge and that have um, found um, contradiction with some cultural values in some segments have backslash because there are things that are not accepted by all consumers in the same way and one more time this reflects this diversity this reflects this difference in opinions so it is a sensitive uh, matter that um, uh, markers need to take into account sometimes there is possibility of jumping or using uh, an opportunity to to propose new uh, visions to to portray for example in this um, image in this picture on the lower right hand side you see a this is a commercial for, for Campbell's soup in which they portrayed a uh, two uh, two parents um, a, a, a same-sex marriage um, family raising a, a child and I guess this is something that some years ago would have not been um, accepted by consumers in the same extent that it is now but one more time this talks about or this reflects this um, change in values in this case in american society in something that 20 uh, 15 years ago was probably too um, inappropriate let's say to have done this in, in terms of the predominant cultural cultural values. Finally, let's, let's talk about how advertising transmits meaning, which at the end does the material that we deal with uh, in the context of culture. Uh, here we have a model by Grant McCracken, an anthropologist, that propose how this transfer of meaning uh, operates, right? Based on what we have talked, there is a culturally constituted world there, outside or where we live. And what markers try to do is to attach meaning to brands, to products, by placing them in these worlds represented in advertisement, right? For example, in a slice of life uh, situation. Of course, consumers, in order to understand 
the advertisement in order to make sense of it need to know something about the culture if you suddenly travel to japan and you watch an advertising there you you have never visited japan before you are not related to japanese culture probably the the advertisements there you will not understand them in the way they are intended because you you lack that cultural code so advertising in order for it to work, it, it, it has to be um, in the context of the culture of the audience. Now, if the uh, marketer places the product, the brand into that cultural context, then they are transmitting the meaning by putting together advertising with the situation, with the social world represented in the advertisement so that when consumers purchase the product or the brand they they um, consider or they understand that the meaning is transferred to them right that at the end the purpose of advertising consumers preferring a product because it is something that uh, is adopted based on this cultural mechanism. This example um, of Harley Davidson, I think is one of the most um, useful to, to understand this concept. There, is, there are a number of associations that we, we make about Harley Davidson and about what it represents, about what type of um, people buy uh, motorcycles Harley Davidson and therefore um, the, the, it's been successful to the extent that that people feel highly identify with the brand people within that segment because it represents something again about their identity about their self-concept so advertisement transmit meaning by placing together the objects of interest right like a product um, with certain symbols with certain signs right which have a meaning a cowboy like in the case of marlboro man um, it represents uh, certain values like rocked american right like rough um, american and and the same thing you can um, think about other brands that they try to convey certain meanings, right? Some meanings will be more about liberty and freedom and independence, um, etc. So not necessarily over the same meanings, but um, they depend, of course, on the product, the category, and how you want to position against um, competitors and of course also the the segment of consumers you go after so let's finish here this chapter um, make sure to read um, this chapter five on your own for the quizzes and exams